morning, everyone here in the US, um, and good evening or good afternoon to those of you uh, who are joining us from elsewhere. Um, welcome to another exciting event on Turkish cinema. My name is uh, Tunç Şen. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History and the deputy director of the Sakıp Sabancı Center for Turkish Studies uh, here at Columbia University. Um, it is my distinct pleasure and honor um, to welcome you all to today's conversation uh, with our distinguished guests on one of the classics of uh, Yeshilcham cinema, uh, Ah Güzel Istanbul, uh, Oh Beautiful Istanbul. And we are delighted to host Ayla Algan, uh, the leading actress of the movie, and Murat Belge, uh, eminent cultural critic and professor of comparative literature. Uh, before leaving the floor to my dear colleague and Sakıp Sabanca visiting professor of Turkish studies, uh, Zeynep Çelik, uh, to introduce our uh, guest today, let me express how grateful we are to Sakıp Sabanca family for their invaluable support to promote Turkish studies here in New York and the US. I should also thank uh, Columbia Global Centers Istanbul for co-sponsoring our film series this year. And many thanks to Ararat Shekaryan, our center's uh, program manager, and Sedan Gürbilek uh, from Global Centers Istanbul for their uh, invaluable support. Finally, um, I would like to thank everybody in the audience for being with us today in this special panel. And I want to encourage you all to enrich our conversation with your questions and comments. Uh, you can submit your posts in the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. So without further ado, I'm now turning to uh, Professor Zeynep Çelik. A warm welcome to you all. Today, we are honored to host two eminent figures of Turkish culture and art. I will not even attempt to do justice to their long and remarkable careers with my brief presentations. We have only so little time and so much to talk about. Murat Belge is an academic translator, literary critic, political commentator, and civil rights activist. Belge received his PhD in 1969 from Istanbul University, where he worked on leftist criticism in English literature. After the military coup of 1980, he was compelled to leave academia and he started İletişim Yayınları, a publishing house and Birikim Dergisi, a multidisciplinary critical journal. In 1996, Professor Belge returned to academic life, founding the comparative literature department at Bilgi University, where he still teaches. Belge published numerous articles and books on Turkish literature, Ottoman and Turkish history, Turkish food culture, and the history of Istanbul. His translations into Turkish include works by James Joyce, Charles Dickens, William Faulkner, and John Berger. Ayla Algan is an actress and singer. She was born in Istanbul and educated in French secondary schools. In the early 1960s, Algan moved to the US with her husband Bekran Algan, a key figure in Turkish theater. In New York, she joined the actor's studio. Making her first film debut in 1964 with Artem Guric's legendary movie, Karanlıkta Uyananlar, I don't know how to translate this into, into English, those who woke up in, the, in darkness. Uh -huh. This movie was followed two years later by Ah Güzel İstanbul. Uh, Algan played in more than 50 films in Turkey. In her long theater career, she acted in more than 60 plays, producing and directing many of them at the same time. She's fondly remembered by her roles, among others in Hamlet, The Three Penny Opera, and The Good Man of Sichuan in the 1960s. I believe the last two were the earliest Brecht productions in Turkey. Algan acted in many internationally acclaimed theaters in Europe and the USA, receiving 
many awards. She also pursued a very successful singing career. Those of you who watched Dr. Güzel Istanbul will testify to her lovely voice. Staging 13th century mystic poet Yunus Amre's work in French, English, and German, Algan introduced Yunus Amre's philosophy to a wide international community. She's currently engaged in teaching. Let me now start by asking a question to Ayla Hanım. We will then go wherever the conversation takes us. Ayla Hanım, your movie career in Turkey starts in the 1960s, nostalgically remembered as the golden days of Turkish cinema. Could you say a few words on the atmosphere and the conditions in which you worked? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> I wish Sadri was with me here, sitting and looking at you, Zeynep. That would have been so good for me. Uh, this uh, was my first uh, uh, part, uh, like uh, we call Yardımcı Rol Değil De, uh, first role, mega story. <laughs> first time in my life. So because I was a, a theater person, all I was playing was broad, because theater people <laughs> is not good in cinemas, you know. Now I teach people and I say, if they come from the theater, I say, you go, you finish your conservatory and you come after, I say, because I have to bring all the things they're playing into minimalist, like in light. So I like these days you had giving to us <clears throat> and I'm very happy, <clears throat> sorry. I'm very happy because uh, this bargain, Takas, this bargain we make uh, mostly with uh, Murat Berge, I like him so much. And I think his father was uh, was cineast, uh, with whom he was uh, married, your father, you uh, know? Well, uh, he uh, was the first husband of uh, Gabor. Gabor. Uh, you see, I had learned today, one minute before, Honor really? called, yes, <laughs> and he said, ask him that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So I believe that uh, some sentence that I want to say for this uh, girl I share. I think that uh, I, I want to say that she comes from Izmir. What is Izmir in 67 or before with Kibeles? Artemis, Athena, big gods of woman gods she comes from. And look what I have to make of her, a salad of caricature uh, <laughs> that she tells lies, uh, that she starts uh, when, when I was uh, um, preparing my role theory, I had to take all those things. Like uh, Sadri was taking from the Ottoman Empire and Byzance, you mm. see. So we got uh, the two together, <laughs> Murat. We got in a one song, what? Shahnaz Longa. Yeah, which is yeah. Romanian. <laughs> yeah, you, you see. <laughs> so. It was with Kanun, they played with Kanun. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, he prepares that to this girl who doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. I wish I said at that time that uh, village institutes were there. She would know music. Uh, she would know, uh, yeah, or uh, let's say theater, yani, Burge Teatroler. If we had all this, this girl would have been something else. 
because her ancients and the legacy she has, she is like um, got humble to hold all those uh, uh, legacies in her body and in her mind. Very important. So what I took this was all that time, 67, we start in our charmy, folk culture, to start to the villages, halk sharklarına döndük. This girl is, I got this song, but I couldn't put it because when the film we were making in 67, I wasn't singing. I made a song about this woman, uh, mm. the ox in Anatolia, the ox has a very important, which we need now maybe. Harmanı kaldırdı çünkü. Maybe today we need that, you know, <laughs> this ox. Uh, then there is a poetry of Nazım Hikmet who says, kadınlar, Bizim kadınlarımızı, sofradaki yeri öküzümüzden sonra gelen kadınlar. <gülüyor> And I made a song like that. Koca küzüğün dizindedir. Even in Montra, I was, <gülüyor> I was in the cars uh, making a live program. John Lee. <gülüyor> yes. And everybody was going out from the coffees to look what I was looking down. <gülüyor> Because the ox was for me there, he was sick, he will die. So this village woman like that, uy gocaküzü, neler ettin bana gocaküz? That you, if you die, I have to bring another woman to do your work. Very pathetic. But even now today, they like so much the songs. It's a Middle Anatolia song. And I have written the words. And when I went, made long plays, cassettes, and so they used to put this because the only one was making rating, you know. <laughs> Very good rating I had with that. Everybody liked the song, not me. Even the little boy, I was in Frankfurt. Uh, her mother came in the in shopping places. And she said to me, you know that my four years old, five years old knows your uh, song. And he says to her <laughs> boy, look, I love Ghana, but I love God. And the boy looks like that, he doesn't know me. Ah, when she said, Kojekus, Kojekus, ah, then he said, ah. Ah, so. <laughs> Thank you. Murat John, you, I know that uh, the Ottoman and Byzance, uh, which things I didn't make researches. And of course, when I said yes, because when Art of Humas came to me and to ask to me, are you going to play I said, I'm a theater person. What do you want from me? He said, I don't have money. I gave all, all my money to Sadri. And I don't have money for this girl. Would you like to play? Yeah. <clears throat> I said, of course, Arthur. Even I, if I don't know what I'm going to do, I'll play for you. And that starts that uh, beliefs on cinema. And now I, I give classes about cinema. Can I ask something very quickly about that Izmir detail that you uh, very nicely put it? Um, is it something the script writers had already decided when they wrote the script that the girl, the young woman should be from Izmir aspiring to be an actress and coming to Istanbul or Uh, did you have any, um, you know, contribution, uh, Aida Hanum, to that Izmir detail? I'm sorry that I didn't have any chance to work with uh, Aisha Shasa. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I would have done some other things maybe with her. Uh, when she comes to make photographs, the first scene, 
in Ath Istanbul. Maybe I would have put a lead like Jaylanı malıp götürdüler. Neni yavrum ne? Maybe I could have sing that and take positions, very modern positions, under a uh, cultural uh, woman song. Maybe I would have done that because I, I tried to make a comic type. You know this comic type. Uh, for me, it was good because in theater they made me play classics, classics, two times Ophelia, one time Hamlet on the open net at the Rumeli side. <laughs> so I like this play. I I like this girl. Yani it's a romantic comedy, you see? It's not a broad comedy. Eh? It's a romantic comedy, very good. <laughs> and then when I say that, I had the same chance uh, for Funny Bryce in New York. We were off-Broadway playing too in the K. Phillips School after finishing with uh, Actor Studio. Uh, and then Sesni came and said to me, uh, do you want to play in Funny Girl? The audition was in Paul Newman. I went to Selznick because I was a theater, my husband too. He, he was very bright, beautiful, but he liked directing. So he wouldn't go to Hollywood, you know. Uh, that's why I said, of course, you know, you singing, ah, all these songs I know, my mother was singing to me. I, I was five years old, <laughs> funny Bryce. Uh, and she had the legacy that, um, the person who would play my role, she said, should look like me. And they told me because I, she she was a Jewish girl, you know. And they said, don't talk, don't learn English, don't talk English, talk like her. Uh, the song's all right. And she didn't be, she didn't have beautiful legs. Same thing in me. I don't have beautiful girls. And my mother used to say, you couldn't go dance ballet and make point because your legs are not beautiful. Okay, I start, <laughs> you see. So this girl is this girl. She's funny. She's a really funny girl. But Okay, I, them. I think if this is a very good point from um, Aisha. Well, I'm just he yeah. And here after, we would very that, much... Zeynep, after <laughs> that, I won't take too much things because the things that happened in the scenario, it's not me. Yeah. I don't have anything to do with. I take my last scene. When she says, I lied to you, I'm Aisha. First scene and last scene is my scenario. In between, it's without willing or willing to make her Western or Arabesque things to make her sing for money. You understand? In the middle, it's a story. It's not her. I heard story, <laughs> another thing. Okay, but it's I an interesting... Zeynep, don't worry, I'm not talking anymore. No, no, uh, you will. We will bring <laughs> you back, but we want to hear a little <laughs> bit about Istanbul in the background. But we <laughs> want to hear you. Yes, and I was married in Hilton Hotel, if you oh. want to know. You see, I was very a la mode at that time. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> okay. Till my last scene, I won't talk. <laughs> oh, we'll make you talk. But um, maybe okay. we can put Istanbul on stage now. Yes. <laughs> With Murat. Murat Bey, lütfen. Please. I like him. I like him, Murat. Um, when 1960s, uh, when this film was made, I always think it was a crucial uh, period of uh, Istanbul. 
Istanbul is an ever changing uh, and maybe at the same time never changing uh, city. Um, that uh, in, in modern times and times that we can call modern, which is the Republican period in general, uh, until 1960, uh, I believe, I remember, uh, Istanbul was a city of about a million citizens. And a million citizens I consider uh, sizable community, good enough uh, for, uh, for a city. And as my friend, the writer Orhan Pamuk once said, at that time, this was a city of a million people. Since then, it became a village of 16 million people. Uh, I think the, the paradox uh, really sums it up. Uh, we had a much more organic life uh, in the 60s, much closer to what you can consider natural. Uh, but at the same time, maybe uh, rather behind the, uh, the terms the standards uh, of a modern city. As you can see in this film, in, in many parts, uh, the historical parts uh, especially, um, it was a uh, neglected city, I can say. Um, and uh, so this is a fact by itself, uh, for some of us, it was the good fortune that it was neglected. For some of us, it's the, the opposite. Uh, just before 1960, uh, when we had this coup, Menderes was trying to modernize the city, opening up broader avenues and this and that. And a lot of us who remember those times uh, remember with a lot of nostalgia and, and sorrow for so many things that were sacrificed at the moment, which was not necessary. Uh, but since then, this is, this is the time that uh, industrialization begins in Turkey in general importation of tractors and this and that. So there's this superfluous population in the countryside uh, with the new machinery. And so people start coming to the big cities and the biggest city is Istanbul. Uh, so, so they come. There, there was a period when about 500,000 people came to live in Istanbul every year. Fantastic. Until then, of course, uh, the one million, say two million Istanbul uh, could absorb people and could transmit its uh, culture. When I say culture, I don't mean to say uh, people going to the theater or that sort of thing, but you know, how, how to go to a taverna. I mean, that's, that's uh, cultural enough. Um, but when it got out of hand, then of course, Istanbul was no longer the teacher of uh, behavior and this and that. Uh, it was sort of dragged along behind this gigantic, uh, this city which became more and more gigantic as, as time passed. So uh, in this, film from 66, 67, was it? Um, we can still see uh, uh, Istanbul uh, as, as it used to be for a long, long time, just before the change uh, started. The people who shot the film, Atif, et cetera, who wrote the scenario, were not aware of this happening, really. None of us were, because we were living in it. 
you understand something, uh, once time passes and it becomes the past, and then you, uh, you, you have a better view of where things are standing, etc. Um, and so we have been living in a different Istanbul uh, ever since. Um, well, if we begin to talk about Istanbul, I don't know where it can take us. It's a fantastic, uh, very, very old uh, city with a very rich um, history, cultural, uh, everything. If you have a particular question, you would like Google answer about the city, because I'm to, I could talk only in very general terms. Maybe um, we can specifically talk about the particular neighborhoods uh, manifest in the movie, like Beylar Beyi as so-called the traditional looking uh, small neighborhood on the Bosphorus. And then we have uh, Harbiye and where Hilton Hotel is located. And then we have Sultan Ahmed where a Hashmet character works as a photographer. So what would you like to say about uh, th these references to particular neighborhoods of Istanbul? Well, I should say uh, Beyler Bey. Uh, where his house is, his shack, uh, let's say, is situated. Uh, <clears throat> it has not really changed much. Uh, the Anatolian Asian side of the Bosphorus uh, has been uh, less open to these modern developments. And even today, after all these years, you can go there and see some quaint old corners, uh, etc. And uh, there in the film, what we see, the we keep on seeing the uh, iron railing of the mosque uh, of Beylai Bey, uh, etc. It was. Uh, I think there was a scene uh, around Kandilli as well, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, but these parts have not been uh, changed uh, drastically as some other parts have. And another uh, perhaps paradoxical thing is that Harvey hasn't changed much either because it had already changed. Mm -hmm. But by the time that this film was made, and Hilton, uh, well, Hilton is a significant building. Um, it was a modern building, par excellence, um, but uh, it was built in a period where people had the kind of respect they should have for history and old things, etc. So Hilton uh, is uh, is quite high, eight, nine stories high, but it's not as arrogant, uh, as belligerent as these new modern skyscrapers we keep on uh, seeing nowadays. And there is a there's an aesthetic of uh, Hilton. It doesn't really uh, sort of uh, come and sit down on Istanbul in a bossy way. No, it tries to conform to Istanbul, not to, uh, not, not, not, not to be uh, the, one of these monstrous presences that we have been used to see afterwards. Well, Sultan Ahmed, of course, has changed. Sorry. <clears throat> um, because Sultan Ahmed was bound to be the touristic center. Sultan Ahmed is, geographically speaking, the 
uh, most eastern tip of the city, but culturally speaking, it is the center of the city because the biggest place of worship, the Hagia Sophia, was there. The palace was there. So it's the political center, but also the religious center. And then the hippodrome, the social center. So all this was assembled there. And we had neglected it, as I was saying, uh, for a long time, uh, when we were not breaking it up to build some new stupid buildings. Um, but again, 1960, Turkey entering modern life, modern international relations, tourism, etc. So uh, that area had to have a facelifting, all sorts of lifting uh, had to take place. And so uh, today it is very difficult to find another uh, Hashmet taking photographs with this old uh, antiquated uh, machine uh, and, and another Aisha coming and finding him there. Uh, taking photos. I want to, uh, can I say, Murat, uh, can I say, huh, in, in this Istanbul, there was a cosmopolitan place, and these were the islands, the yes. Prince Islands. Because my childhood, I was there. Every summer, we used to go there. We didn't have a house. We were the Turks, the poor Turks, hmm. who went from Jumuriyet, after Jumuriyet, my mother, my father. <laughs> my father came from Crete Islands. He liked very much Vilkada. And hmm. then my friends were <clears throat> Jewish, hmm. Armenian, hmm. Greeks. Mm -hmm. We used to go to Ayorgi, mm -hmm. where there was a church which we could have drink wine. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's there again. Yeah. In the 60s, some people went there and disturbed them. And uh, bourgeois uh, boys, girls, not girls, boys mostly, uh, disturbed the uh, patriarchal place because there, there is a, uh, a beautiful, the, in Love Street, we call Ashiklar Yolo, Orda. My grandfather used to make painting, oil painting, post-impressionist. Now in Poland, they will do that. His uh, pictures will go, his paintings will go. So, uh, and tonight, Tunnel was, which I was living there, Tunnel, Le Bon, Marquis, was the place that everybody used to uh, build up themselves for beautiful things and make a uh, long uh, walks till taxi, you see. And at that time, we were just uh, uh, taking my, uh, my, uh, winter uh, clothes, uh, our winter uh, blanket and things, and we were make we were make a gutch in Bukoda. Reshat mm. Nurudin taking is there to his house. Mm. Many mm. folks are there, uh, but rich people had their villas, mm. and with their key. They used to come out and talk. So we were as in the Titic piece mm -hmm. the Turks in the islands. The Turks is a minority. Yeah, mm -hmm. Tunnel at the same time. Yeah. Tunnel too. Poland people make the Tunnel and things like that. So it was very cosmopolitan. It was when Atatürk 
gave the place in Tunel, Shishane, to the Jewish people who all the world wouldn't take them. Mm. You remember that, Nura? Uh, no. Yeah. Not exactly. uh, not, not Shishan, that area. All the Jewish, my friends, in Damjos Yomto, they mm. were there because they came from the sea and he gave this is here is for you, he said to the Jewish people who came to Istanbul. He mm. invited them. Nobody in the world wanted them. <laughs> and uh, when we say we don't say Yahudi, we say it Musevi. <laughs> There's a, there's a funny story about that when uh, Yehudi <laughs> Menuhin was to come for a concert in uh, yeah, well, I knew, yeah, everybody yeah. was coming. Oh, yeah, Sophia Vambo. Oh, Sophia Vambo. Oh, everybody yeah. was coming. Oh, Sophia Vambo, yes. Well, but the newspaper man changed the name of Yehudi Menuhin. Thinking yeah. it could be an insult, so he made it Musevi Menuhin. Yeah, that's why Musi Nakuru, which is my director who built up the theater, the opera, and so uh, he was saying everybody in Istanbul has his own theater, but we don't have a Turkish theater. <laughs> Bailar, Bayanlar, please. <laughs> He was a theater, that they, and after they built up the, the National Theater. Mm. That's all, my old days. Now they know my age. I, can I, can you hear me? Can I maybe join, because I wonder about this, you know, uh, we have uh, also a very important aspect of the movie is the class representation, and we have these uh, women, you know, uh, at the beginning of this monologue, Hashmet is introducing them, you know, Hashmet has an interesting, you know, relationship with a woman. He, he, he is like, uh, you know, he is kind of forced to get married, you know, or his friends and his circle, you know, at this mehane almost like every day, oh, Hashmet, you know, like you have to get married, whatever. And he recalls and you know, he, he introduces us these women and everything. But how would you, Professor uh, Balge, would you read that connection? He's his relationship with Aisha, for example, he is this, you know, at the beginning of the movie, he calls himself, uh, oh, lazy Hashmet, oh, miskin, oh, lazy, you know, oh, this, uh, how would you translate miskin? Uh, I don't know, but lazy, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, this, yeah, yeah. So uh, he's uh, calling himself a lazy person. He, he, he has this background, you know, this glorious, you know, uh, background. Actually, Hashmet, uh, the name itself means glorious. Yes. Yeah, so he's like recalling his past and then he has a mother, uh, like in the second sentence of the movie, we are introduced to her. The mother abandons the family and him, you know, running away with an officer. And then Hashmet has this interesting relationship with, uh, with women, you know, to get married. And then he's like, oh, I would maybe get married to this uh, rich woman, but oh, this woman would make me a lot of uh, problems. I would maybe get married to this uh, you know, a daughter of this, uh, you know, Delhi uh, owner, but she would even make me problems. So I don't know. Uh, and then you have Aisha and Hashmet falls in love, uh, literally, uh, uh, with Aisha. And he's like, uh, you have this uh, uh, scene, you know, he's like, uh, they are in this uh, um, uh, small, uh, you know, hut, Kulube uh, Ahsan, you know, they, uh, they with the Ottoman name, they call it the, the house of, you know, the the hut of the sorrow, whatever, which is sorrow is very, yeah. you know, it is Istanbul actually in the movie or, or yeah. you know, from Orhan Pamuk too. So how, how would you read it? Because he says, okay, I'm going to get a real job, you know, for Aisha. And he's like, uh, okay, I'm going to go see my old friends, you know, maybe they give me a job. And then you have this very strange bank uh, scene, you know, he's at the bank, he's about to see the director, but he runs away and he says, even if they whip, whip me here, I wouldn't get this nine to five job and become, you know, become the the the part of this capitalistic, uh, you know, system, whatever. I don't know. What is your comment about? Well, uh, let me start saying something general. 
about the film, uh, like so many works of art, uh, the film has its own allegory, I would say. It's not a medieval allegory, obviously, but uh, the, the characters we see are not just Aisha, are not just Hashmet, they are the types of certain classes, certain strata uh, living in the city. So uh, Hashmet is the, the sort of the old the remainder of the old aristocracy, which we have to qualify in the Turkish case because the Ottoman system did not allow for a landed aristocracy. So in a way, what was aristocratic in life came, came through education. And so the, this gave place to the uh, three generational uh, social structure uh, of especially a place like Istanbul, where one man, one intelligent, able man makes money uh, and he dies. His sons take over and they start spending that money. And when we come to the third generation, it's poverty. So uh, Hashmit is uh, in a way a representative of this social phenomenon. And he, he happens to be the third generation. Uh, his father has uh, devoured whatever was left from the grandfather. And so he is now this uh, photographer. Uh, so um, he has to be uh, a womanizer, which is part of that uh, social class, but then at the same time, he is this nonchalant uh, bohemian who cannot uh, commit himself to, to any sort of discipline. He, he, he can exist, apparently, as we see in the film. He is not prosperous or anything, but he can survive. Uh, and so he doesn't need any luxury. Uh, and although he likes to be with women and enjoys being with a woman, uh, he is at the same time afraid of uh, the woman, the wife, becoming the boss. There he is also the Ottoman male. Uh, I mean, the uh, possible uh, prospective brides uh, in the neighborhood, which he can uh, choose. Uh, they come from wealthier families. Maybe they will ask for uh, uh, expensive clothes, whatever. Uh, and he doesn't want to go into this bother. And, and then comes uh, Aisha, and uh, Aisha represented by Ayla. So she is very sweet. Uh, and uh, I see. And it's, it's, a, it's a different, very different uh, yeah. experience for him. This uh, woman, this, this young girl, is not part of life that he knows. And she's an outsider anyway, comes from his. I, I, I want to add something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I want to add something. Uh, yes. Hashmet knows that Aisha is a virgin. Mm. And she is a virgin. Let's say she comes from Izmir for the Virgin Mary house. She knows this house, Aisha. Hashmet doesn't know, but uh, she, uh, Aisha knows this house. They go and put candles. Mm. They still do tourists. So I thought that the matriarchal finishes with Virgin Mary. 
<laughs> nobody believes now that uh, you can have a child like Jesus Christ uh, without uh, having a man, right? Saint Pierre was with her there. It was the last patriarchal beginning was beginning with Virgin Mary. So what she has to to the girl was not to be spoiled, not to be. She was a, like a crystal for her, him. That if you touch her, she can break. You see that. Uh, you, even if she kisses her, she kisses her from here. And the girl is kissing her because she's still from Aphrodite. She kisses him from the mouth. He, he doesn't kisses her. He kisses her from here. <laughs> but the Aisha kisses her from the mouth. She is Venus. She is Aphrodite. She comes from Izmir, you know, Ionian. Well, Aphrodite is not so virgin. <laughs> no, I don't think she is virgin. She couldn't. Uh, I don't think. You well, think? I, say, I, I, say I, played, I played that. I don't uh, give my virginity. I played that. But yeah. I don't know. Well, uh, maybe more than being a physically a virgin. Aisha has the character of virginality with her. She is, uh, uh, that, that, that, I mean, with her innocence, uh, etc. Uh, even if she went to bed with some people, the, her character would not change. In that sense, uh, uh, I, think, uh, uh, in her. I don't think she went. No, she wasn't. <laughs> she wasn't I, like Ophelia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's, uh, I think, uh, well, uh, I'm talking too much, maybe, but. Uh, no, talk, I, talk. I love you. I love you. Uh, I said uh, uh, it has its uh, allegoric sides because it's about a certain problem. Uh, that certain problem is a huge problem faced by the entire world, westernization, modernization. The West started this damn thing. So we all had to follow and uh, change our lifestyle, change everything. And it's so uncomfortable to be forced to change your way of life. And in these years, the 60s, uh, in Turkish cultural life, the left was sort of emerging, anti-imperialism was a uh, constant topic. And of course, it was very easy to identify the West with imperialism. That's where it comes from. And in those years, uh, actually this is about two years before, I think, uh, Kemal Tahir's uh, novel, uh, mother state, the foundation of the Ottoman Empire uh, was published. And the cinema people of that period, uh, not just out of uh, director here, but also Metin Erksan, Halit Rifi, etc. They were all great fans of uh, Kemal Tahir. And from him, uh, they got introduced. Kemal Tahir was a Marxist of a sort. Uh, but by that time, Kemal Tahir had uh, divorced, made his divorce uh, to Orthodox Marxism, according to which the Ottoman society had to be a feudal society and then 
passing on to a kind of underdeveloped capitalism and this and that. But Kemal Tahir was an admirer of the Ottoman state, which he regarded as a proto-socialist uh, state. And talking about uh, infrastructure, uh, superstructure, etc., etc., he put the idea uh, into the, especially the cinema people's minds, that uh, with a different uh, infrastructure, the superstructure has to change. So all these films that we admire so much, gone with the wind, whatever, uh, are the outcomes, the products of Western world, capitalism, etc. And so this should not appeal to Turks who have had a different history, and so they should have different aesthetic values, different aesthetic approaches at the same time. And the, the Turkish filmmakers uh, thought this was a good idea. Um, and, and here we, we see that, uh, we see traces of this approach. Uh, like I would say, uh, he, he meets an old friend at the time, is thinking of making money. And they say uh, it's, it's a group of people, silly people. Uh, they will introduce Western music. Uh, and he asks, uh, well, if, they, if people don't like it, they say, no, no, no, they will like it. And so they make the, uh, the man at the taverna play this very horrible thing, whatever it is, uh, a, a very bad example of Western music, if that was the idea. Um, and then they are kicked out, uh, etc. Now, uh, I sympathize with this sort of thing uh, to the point of uh, not uh, taking this haughty attitude towards your own tradition. I personally like uh, classical old Ottoman music very much. Uh, and people should, I mean, of course, you, you, you, you mustn't use such words as must, should, ought to, etc. in artistic, uh, cultural matters, but there's nothing wrong with uh, liking that sort of music. And there's nothing wrong with not liking that kind of music. Um, but there is, again, no point in uh, making a, a sort of uh, evaluation. You know, this is good because it's mine. I mean, those people in the taverna, it would be better for them if they could also listen to Eine Klein and Ach Musik uh, together with uh, uh, B, B Menschen or uh, whatever. Uh, those things I uh, am still critical about the whole period, but also there are traces of that in uh, Artif. Uh, Artif was not as doctrinaire as Metin Erksan and the, uh, especially Hadi Trifi. Uh, they were very strict about this. Artif was always, you know, uh, finding his own way, his own style. He had this uh, knack, uh, very, very sweet too. And this is what I can say in criticism of uh, the film, which otherwise I like a lot. I may jump much. in. Um, I, I'm very curious about the set, the, the 
the conditions in which you worked. And I'm wondering, Ailanam, how much improvisation is there in this movie, some of the dialogues come across as so authentic and as though they were just produced there. And I'm wondering if you made those up as you went along or whether everything was scripted. When, uh, when we were working, uh, because I'm a theater people, of course, I knew all the text. I was, I know all the text. And Sadri was a filmmaker, which I learned a lot of things from me, which I'm teaching now. The way he plays, the way when you think, when you go into a flashback, when you come back from the flashback, uh, the things he knows helped me. Even now, when I'm teaching cinema, I my scenarios are made some uh, some thinking of Sadri. Mm -hmm. which I learned how to talk in policier, use pronouns, and I, I show them everywhere. When I say, I don't say like him, he doesn't say, sadly, subtext, play the subtext, like in theater. I play, I make them play a situation, like homeostasis, beliefs now in this moment because cinema is not like theater even if you're silent he takes your body language you play with your body right so the people when you say in diction or doublage s s he stopped talking but his body is that he's playing you mm -hmm. see the difference with theater when you make and of course, the things I gained from him made me uh, much better, but after a while, is, uh, made me but much better to see the cinema. At the moment we are there, mostly we didn't have time to look to my scenario, but at that time, um, all the regisseurs had uh, they were making films too you know mm -hmm. with other people's scenarios they has a making houses mm -hmm. but they were directors so what we start with Karan and on that a film which my father even paid, and after they escaped, because it was too much uh, against the uh, rich people, <laughs> against uh, a, a film like that. We had stories and so it doesn't matter. It was a good thing. Uh, those who's, uh, who wakes up at night uh, was the subject. It was my first film, but it wasn't the first part I was playing. Like Arthur's Alistair, it was my first uh, place that I do. And we want to put a syndicate, like in America. Yes, it's up. But mm -hmm. the thing is coming because the filmmaker, the patron of, of the film, and the director was the same man. Mm -hmm. ah, it was a funny. A real a funny story, of course, but we did. And Memdu in Lutuakat wanted that. So they start. Uh, I was playing you the step there, a little role, and I was assisting Memdu to know feeling what is film. I just came from America to, to see what's happening in films. And he used to call me, talk mark. Look what I give to the people. I give them Lufer, Lufer, <laughs> the food he was bringing for the workers. He was <laughs> saying, you see, he was calling me Topmak, etc. And uh, those people came and uh, worked with us in the worker film, Karan Toena, mm -hmm. of the syndicate. 
Mm -hmm. After that, we told them Ertem Görec. There is a Ertem Görec uh, thing which my assistant made uh, about how they build up the syndicates because he was that Ertem Görec. Um, one, uh, and uh, at the end, we said, look, we give the syndicate, the syndicate to you. You have to choose somebody. We can't be that actors, directors, and syndicate. We have to have somebody. Oh, no, no, we can't. They said, we can't. We are very happy. We used to eat down in the floor. That the Turkish people in Ottoman, some has that big uh, things on the floor. And we are very happy, and we can't say my patron is Memdu because he is my director. <laughs> it was a comic thing what we had used in Hollywood, in our Hollywood, let's say. <laughs> yes, you tell. Uh, Ailana, ma'am, to the best of my knowledge, uh... The film received an award in Italy, right? A couple of years after yes, yes. it was but, produced. Uh, Do you know anything about how the film was received in other countries, in Turkey? I mean, how? Very good. And now it's in uh, all the universities, like a classic. <laughs> in mm. Cyprus, I went in Cyprus. I went to Poland, you know. What theater is I that I go? You understand? Mm -hmm. uh, but what is, what is uh, so central? Yeah, the, second, the second prize, because Black, uh, Yeshi Chamai, Hollywood, they, he didn't have money to make uh, color films. And because we were white, black and white, we became second. Otherwise, we would have get the first. But I don't think this film was. Gani was a wonderful cameraman. He was funny, like that holding, not having anything down his hand. He was making puns, all the Bosphorus. All the Bosphorus, he didn't have a hanger in his hand. He was doing it himself. And I think black and white was something more nostalgic, maybe. It's nice, I like it. Huh? Black and white, I like. Mm. I also am thinking right now of the documentary value of this film. And I would like to show it in my class on Istanbul as another Istanbul, because it's very hard uh, for people to visualize what the hills of the Bosphorus look like. And when you look from the Anatolian side, there's nothing on those hills. So I'm wondering if that contributes in your minds to the value of the film. The yellows, I recognize them, Murat, but they are so dolled up now. They're painted, they're restored, the ones in the back of the hut, the, the mm -hmm. big yellow. Yeah. So, yes, it is the same thing, but it's not the same thing. So I, I'd like to hear what you think about that documentary value. Well, this became a fashion, you know. Uh, people uh, began to uh, watch old films, uh, not for the films, but to see what Istanbul was like when those films were shot. Um, so, I mean, this is a fact, that the change of the city. And it, it is a fact which makes many people who remember something uh, nostalgic. Uh, so it's really, really understandable. Um, I mean, it was picturesque in its own way. It was beautiful in its own way, original, uh, not like anything we saw 
Uh, very human. I remember I wrote about it in my book on Istanbul. Uh, I was sitting in a park around Kumkapı. Uh, I usually go there a lot. By the wall, there was a tall wall. There was a cart, but the cart was something like a hut on four wheels. It had a door, some steps. It had two windows, which were always closed. Obviously, someone was living in that hut, converted from uh, a cart of some kind. One day, the door opened, and the dwarf came out. So it was this dwarf who had made it uh, his home. And I remember it was so touching. It was I mean, made you laugh, but at the same time, you felt like crying. You know, uh, the city was something like this. Uh, and, and that city disappeared. I used to walk a lot when I was a university student, and I used to see these uh, very decrepit uh, houses, buildings, uh, using anything they could lay their hands on as building material. So this part of the house was brick, the other part was tin, the other part was cardboard or whatever. No windows, nothing, poverty. Uh, but then there would be these flowers. Uh, the flower, they did not have enough money to buy flower pots. It was the olive oil or flower oil can, uh, the most luxurious uh, flower pots. And they, in spite of the poverty and all that, these people had will to live and joie de vivre. I mean, they, they knew how to enjoy life uh, in, in the most horrible conditions. Uh, so this is something that, you know, one really misses. Uh, it was, it was a, a way of life. We have some really oh, good yeah, questions yeah. in the Q&A box, and I would like to encourage our participants to, yes. you know, uh, post their questions and comments. Um, so maybe we can uh, pick one of those questions uh, as a startup. Uh, Kevin Riley's question just struck me for uh, some reason. Let me just um, read it out loud, and you can also uh, read um, the question in the Q&A box. Um, he's saying, um, I lived in Sinop in the early 70s and visited Istanbul in 1972. In this movie, there are some very modern aspects of 1966 Istanbul, like cars, dress, music, live entertainment, etc., that we didn't have in Sinop in the 70s. Yes. As the modernity of Istanbul now moved out to smaller cities in Turkey, such as Sinop, in other words, has the modernity of small cities caught up to the modernity of Istanbul and other large Turkish cities? Any thanks to you? Yeah. Not really. There are some like Konya, for instance. Konya is, of course, the uh, main example for this kind of thing, where the conservative ideology is dominant. Mm -hmm. And so they reject this kind of thing. But in a lot of other places, it's more uh, to be explained uh, on, on financial terms. They are poor, so they can't afford that kind of life. On the other hand, of course, uh, compared with those years, 
72, etc. Um, many uh, other cities are like, uh, well, not maybe exactly like Istanbul, but much closer to uh, Istanbul of that time uh, than they used to be at the time. Uh, and here you can uh, include a, uh, a city like Diyarbakir, for instance. Uh, there you can find uh, a lot of modernity. But in general, uh, we are talking about uh, a conservative country. Uh, here we have the three big cities that they, well, Istanbul is alone. We can also include it in, in the trio, Ankara and Izmir. And then come you know, Bursa, Edirne, etc. cetera. Um, and going towards more and more uh, conservative. So we have, we have everything. I mean, this has always been a complex society, never a uniform society. And it still somehow keeps that character. Do we have other questions? There are other questions. Oh, well, let let me um, bring this one up, which, because it is really fun, and I think we're all thinking of this. Uh, Berkhan Eminsoy says, I have to say this is the most fun webinar I've been a part of. I'm curious about Ayla Hanım's secret to a life full of her positive, vivacious energy. Ah, at Sinop, he says, Sinop, I have a Black Sea song. Woman's lip, woman's lip. Fashum daki asbanun, pemberdum parasuni, denis deki takandun, pemaldum yarisuni, pemaldum yarisuni. Tapan chances to fix is the hakimi ala jau, hamsi palu jibide, hopo poinata jau. This is my black sea song, my love. And your vivacious energy. It's very artistic. Yeah. <laughs> she says, don't look, I have long hair. Sachimuzun akliki sazanet man. Don't think that my have long hair, that my spirit is not working. <laughs> Did I make a good language? I, I should make those songs in English. Uh, Talat Alman made my English in Yunus Emre. He was very good. He was a little bit not uh, uh, the body of Yunus Emre is a Sufi. He is mm -hmm. an Anatolian Sufi. Yeah. So some words you wouldn't say that way. And he's Shakespearean in language. I drift, I'm sad. Yunus Emre never says that I'm drift, I'm sad. I'm walking, he says. <laughs> You understand? So, uh, Anatolia's buddies, we call, you can see at the Black Sea, a big man like that, all black, all thin, a man, a man. Yeah. man mo most women like this kind of man, you know, his buddy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but these people in uh, Sinop, uh, Trabzon, uh, uh, all over this place, Ordo, they make like that, their dance is like that. Can you imagine? And their little uh, uh, steps they take is like a ballet. It's so like womanly, romantic, sweet, with delighted body, you see. <laughs> There's yeah, yeah. also the uh, sort of uh, summing up of uh, so many different cultural uh, 
traditions and currents. And when you talk about dance on the Black Sea, there must be a lot of Greek origin for that. Uh, yeah. kind of yeah. uh, towards the east, then of course the Georgians yeah. coming, uh, etc. Uh, everywhere you can find Armenians, everywhere you can find Greeks. Uh, I, I uh, when I start singing after the seven two uh, thing, window closures yet Michigan. We went to uh, Erkan, had us in Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. We went there. We went with a group of uh, Black Sea dancers, folklore. Mm -hmm. And you know the applauses. You know that I was calling them at the yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was taking them on the scene. Nobody wanted to go out of the Eiffel Tower, and the Eiffel Tower was closing at 12 or 1 o'clock. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wanted to go There was a man, that old man, who was working uh, years in Eiffel Tower, says, Madame, that here they it come the best African dancers. Mm. And they didn't have such an applause yeah. <laughs> with yours. They were so beautiful. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> and in saint uh, which you talked before, uh, La Mama Peter, La Mama Etc., Helen in America, she came and we built up all uh, uh, big corridors on the uh, church there. And she did the same thing in America. We mm -hmm. went to uh, make his life, 13th century. Mm -hmm. She was very good. Uh, she said to me, you go to tap to camera when you're going, you're going to make a Turkish dance. Mm -hmm. I said, I a Turkish dance. <laughs> in our place in Istanbul, Turkish dance meets sex, sexual dance. They put money and so mm -hmm. I can't do. I can't do. I am Yunus Emre. I can't do. Yes, this is not sex. It's giving a child. Mm. And we were surprised for us. <laughs> We say, if Turkish people come, they say, what she is doing, this woman, she's <laughs> mad. These things. To go back to the movie, uh, I mean, it's so wonderful to, you know, hear such, uh, uh, you know, experiences and comments. But I have a counterfactual question um, about the very end of the movie. Uh, where there is some sense of hope towards the future compared to all the melancholy and sorrow and the nostalgia embedded in this dark comedy. What I would like to ask you is, I mean, what kind of a life you, do you think Hashmet and Aisha would live uh, after at the very... Same, at the same place he was there, where the, the, their friends were drinking and she was serving. That, that place is beautiful. Mm -hmm. well, the sea is there. The, it's the beautiful place of the Bosphorus. Well, uh, it could be a, a real happy end in the sense that uh, Aisha has a lot to learn. And uh, Ashmet is in the position of teaching her. You know, as long as this kind of actually bossy relationship goes on, uh, they will both be happy. Uh, one learning the other teaching. Uh, and by, by the time he has taught everything, they will be too old to separate anyway. 
<laughs> Do you think Hashmet would show any signs of change towards his insistence on preserving a, a particular cultural traditions? Would he be open to that sort of change, thanks to Aisha? Um, I don't think he would change his lifestyle. He, he, that would be too much. Uh, but I think Aisha could do with him. Uh, unless she learned too much. <laughs> ah. It will be the arabesque songs she's going to sing. <laughs> Not yet, Nazlonga. Arabesque songs. That yeah. was our, after this uh, thing. Our music became arabesque. Uh, arabesque is a style uh, that uh, Rococo came in uh, painting mm. in the columns. They put grapes in the columns. And so this is called an arabesque. Uh, it's not pejorative. Uh, uh, uh, uh, to add another culture to the culture who is at that time. To add, to bring a new thing, which uh, an ancient uh, thing. So uh, that she will try to bring sing, but if she is going to continue to sing, it will be the arabesque, because after 60s. I think she is, she is uh, open to, to new influences. I think she would learn how to sing Sergei uh, Ramanum Yok, Nide Imsan Shemende. That would be easier than uh, Ashmet uh, singing. Ah, you say yes, yes, yes. ah, Hashmet, Hashmet would teach to play piano. Yeah. Uh, Mesela, I believe if, if she wants, she will learn. She yeah. wants, she won't need this girl. No. And her girl needs it. No, no, no. She's not no. that thing. She will do music. Well, an agreement around to Etik Fersan, maybe Shevki Bey, uh, if not uh, Utri, uh, or uh, Zekai Dede Efendi. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, th I think Aisha would also enjoy that sort of music. Yes. Folk, our folk music is very beautiful. Oh, yes, sure. Very beautiful. Uh, there is an Aegean uh, Seas uh, songs. Then is in deep in the ice. Then is in the... Who maybe uh, it's very close to Izmir, this song. And it's mm -hmm. uh, about uh, telling uh, under the sea what's going on with her. Yes. Okay, uh, you don't have other questions from the audience? Uh, we have we have a few different. We are running out of time actually, but uh, maybe before wrapping up, we can we can take. Two, two more questions. What do you think? Yes. Um, there is one to Professor Belge, and I'd like to read it. Okay. Um, you define the main character, Hashmet, as someone from Riches to Rags. If this so, film. Someone from? Riches to Rags. Mm -hmm. If this film were to be made today, probably the character would have been exactly the opposite from Rags to Riches. <sighs> Why do you think, well, this is a big question, but it's sort of fun. Why do you think the social change has happened? Ah, from what to what you said, Zeynep? Rags to riches. What if from if it were shot now, it ah. would be from rags to riches, whereas in this case, it's from riches to rags. I don't know. 
Well, yes, uh, in the uh, traditional society, it was uh, education that got you the rank. And once you got the rank, then you could reach out to the riches, um, which then your family threw away. Um, now, uh, we still have a bit of this, uh, but uh, this involves uh, a lot of uh, uh, fraudulent behavior. And uh, now that this has become a capitalist society of a kind, uh, then we can find people sort of rising uh, and uh, rank uh, is always lurking somewhere there because uh, each political party, each political movement comes with its own prospective bourgeoisie. Like today we have the famous five companies uh, who are the favorites of the present government. So th in that way, they are uh, creating their own bourgeoisie. So again, uh, rank and riches are in some way uh, interlinked. You don't, you don't really have the uh, Rothschild family etc. anymore. Professor Berge, you uh, use the word bohemian to characterize Hashmet. And I think the word also, uh, you know, was used in the movie itself. I'm really curious about bohemian aspect of Hashmet as a character and what really makes him bohemian. And, you know, can we have a bohemian a la turca in the way Hashmet, you know, um, lives the life. Yeah. Well, you had a kind of a la turca uh, bohemian and Secret Adil wrote about it, uh, Osman Mesjid book, uh, etc. Um, I call him bohemian because he comes from uh, a genteel mm -hmm. family tradition. Uh, the genteelity is there, but the money has disappeared. So he is sort of underclass. But take this relationship with, with Aisha, even though he is a poor man, by marrying him, Aisha is sort of going on the social ladder because he is the gentleman and not, not Aisha. And uh, so he is a sort of, uh, comes from an aristocratic family that has lost its fortune, uh, but he is very happy uh, living with poor people, poor modest people. If he were to make uh, a choice, even when the family had money. Uh, this sort of man would go to the friends that we see because he enjoys that kind of society. Well, he's a drinker. Um, that is about uh, his only uh, sin in life. So he, he does not do some of the things that we see Bohemian people doing in uh, Mystère de Paris, etc., in that sort of literature, uh, is a more uh, static character. He, he likes to sit down and have his drink rather than go and run and uh, do things uh, here and there. He's not that type, but... Uh, uh, finally, uh, he, he is a bohemian. He, he keeps on a bohemian 
existence. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, would like to, yeah. I, I think we're out of time, but we have a last question. It's not a question. I think it may be appropriate to read this. It's a bit long. Um, hear this. I don't have anonymous attendee. Thank you, anonymous attendee. I don't have a question, but I wanted to say something. I didn't realize yesterday when I saw this event that dear Ayla Algad will also be here. It is a great honor to listen to her and Murat Belge. As a young person who has studied history and works on Istanbul, I tend to romanticize Istanbul's past as a history student and should not, and usually get caught up in nostalgia about Istanbul that I did not experience. However, I have said this catchphrase, Ah Güzel Istanbul, many times. In the opposite side where Sadri Alışık says, Ah Güzel Istanbul, in Rumeli Hisara. Mm -hmm. Often wondered how Tefik Fikret wrote his poem, Sis, Mist, but I understood it later on. Istanbul has changed so much that I cannot even imagine it. But I think Istanbul has a spirit, as Hegel defines it, and it will always make us say, Ah, you said Istanbul, and we always feel the same feeling that dear Ayla Algan and Sadri Alishik give us at the end of the film on the ferry. Thank you so much for the works you have done. Uh, thank you very much, Safa. Thank you, Safamji. Thank you, all the literary things you made for us. We thank you very much, very much. I hope we do panels like that about theater. Maybe mm -hmm. next time in person. Uh, this time yes. it was in Istanbul, time. hopefully. Or here in, in New, New York. York. In, in New York. For, yeah. New, for New York, yes, yes. As much as I know, because I lived there for five years. Uh, at that time, we used to make after. Actor studio we used to make uh, with Wendell K. Philip off off Broadway. There was off Broadway that time in 56, 60s. You know, there wasn't off off Broadway. There was off only one. <laughs> we played Godot uh, in Boston and so tournees. I like New York. Yeah. I like. You can't help liking New York. I, I won't stay, but I, I like to go because uh, there is a, um, today's, you can find yourself in today's, let's say, the big uh, museums, the uh, environmental arts. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's much better than Paris. Uh, New York for me, it's much new. I can learn new things than mm -hmm. Paris. Paris yeah. is dead now, and now it's better. Yeah, it's no good. But lately in New York, I didn't go. But I think that the book I gained from there, the <laughs> intellectual thing, objects, painting, now is New York, not Paris. Not uh, Rive Gauche, not Rive Gauche. We are hoping to bring you to New York in person. Yes. And we, may, we, we bring uh, New York, you know what? <clears throat> the existentialism, you know, Sartre, Camus, Mireille Mathieu, singers, black uh, dresses, uh, animals here, the singers, the street singers, mm. <laughs> that we can put it in New York. But there is two, there is beautiful people there. There is the, mm, in Germany there was two. I stayed five years, I did uh, workers, uh, Turkish workers, uh, teaching and doing, uh, uh, playing with them, making a theater. 
with Petrus. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm very sorry. I have to interrupt because we have to finish here. We are out of time. We are finishing with this beautiful picture, beautiful scene from the movie that Professor Shen is now uh, sharing with us uh, from his from his ah. camera. Yes, uh, we, we have to finish uh, the, the next uh, uh, meeting of our Turkey through its cinema uh, will be on April 8, uh, Friday, uh, this time, uh, New York time is 12, Turkey, Turkey time it's 8 p.m. And we will be talking about another documentary this time. It's called Ah Gözel Istanbul, uh, yeah. Invisible to the Eye, with participation of the director Zeynep Dadak, uh, Richard Pena and Jamal Kafadar. Uh, from from Harvard University. So we thank you, everyone. Uh, Professor Belge, Ailanum, uh, uh, Professor. I, I want to send my love to Shekner. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Yes. And good that to build up uh, arts. Uh, that all arts are. Thank you, Shekner. I heard that you are not died. You and me, we didn't die. Yes, yes. <laughs> the same age. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. much.